Chapter 1, Part 1 of The River War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The River War, an account of the reconquest of the Sudan, by Winston S. Churchill. Chapter 1. The Rebellion of the Mahdi The northeastern quarter of the continent of Africa is drained and watered by the Nile. Among and about the headstreams and tributaries of this mighty river lie the wide and fertile provinces of the Egyptian Sudan. Situated in the very center of the land, these remote regions are on every side divided from the seas by 500 miles of mountain, swamp, or desert. The great river is their only means of growth, their only channel of progress. It is by the Nile alone that their commerce can reach the outer markets, or European civilization can penetrate the inner darkness. The Sudan is joined to Egypt by the Nile, as a diver is connected with the surface by his air pipe. Without it, there is only suffocation. Ot nilis, ot nihil. The town of Khartoum, at the confluence of the Blue and White Niles, is the point on which the trade of the South must inevitably converge. It is the great spout through which the merchandise collected from a wide area streams northward to the Mediterranean shore. It marks the extreme northern limit of the fertile Sudan. Between Khartoum and Aswan, the river flows for 1,200 miles through deserts of surpassing desolation. At last the wilderness recedes, and the living world broadens out again into Egypt and the Delta. It is with events that have occurred in the intervening waste that these pages are concerned. The real Sudan, known to the statesman and the explorer, lies far to the south, moist, undulating, and exuberant. But there is another Sudan, which some mistake for the true, whose solitudes have pressed the Nile from the Egyptian frontier to Omdurman. This is the Sudan of the soldier. Destitute of wealth or future, it is rich in history. The names of its squalid villages are familiar to distant and enlightened peoples. The barrenness of its scenery has been drawn by skillful pen and pencil. Its ample deserts have tasted the blood of brave men. Its hot, black rocks have witnessed famous tragedies. It is the scene of the war. This great tract, which may conveniently be called the military Sudan, stretches with apparent indefiniteness over the face of the continent. Level plains of smooth sand, a little rosier than buff, a little paler than salmon, are interrupted only by occasional peaks of rock, black, stark, and shapeless. Rainless storms dance tirelessly over the hot, crisp surface of the ground. The fine sand, driven by the wind, gathers into deep drifts and silts among the dark rocks of the hills, exactly as snow hangs about an alpine summit. Only it is a fiery snow, such as might fall in hell. The earth burns with the quenchless thirst of ages, and in the steel-blue sky scarcely a cloud obstructs the unrelenting triumph of the sun. Through the desert flows the river, a thread of blue silk drawn across an enormous brown drugget. And even this thread is brown for half the year. Where the water laps the sand and soaks into the banks, there grows an avenue of vegetation which seems very beautiful and luxuriant by contrast with what lies beyond. The Nile, through all the three thousand miles of its course vital to everything that lives beside it, is never so precious as here. The traveller clings to the strong river as to an old friend, staunch in the hour of need. All the world blazes, but here is shade. The deserts are hot, but the Nile is cool. The land is parched, but here is abundant water. The picture painted in burnt sienna is relieved by a grateful flash of green. Yet he who had not seen the desert or felt the sun heavily on his shoulders would hardly admire the fertility of the riparian scrub. Unnourishing reeds and grasses grow rank and coarse from the water's edge. The dark, rotten soil between the tussocks is cracked and granulated by the drying up of the annual flood. The character of the vegetation is 
inhospitable. Thorn bushes, bristling like hedgehogs and thriving arrogantly, everywhere predominate and with their prickly tangles obstruct or forbid the path. Only the palms by the brink are kindly, and men journeying along the Nile must look often towards their bushy tops, where among the spreading foliage the red and yellow glint of date clusters proclaims the ripening of a generous crop, and protests that nature is not always mischievous and cruel. The banks of the Nile, except by contrast with the desert, display an abundance of barrenness. Their characteristic is monotony. Their attraction is their sadness. Yet there is one hour when all is changed. Just before the sun sets towards the western cliffs, a delicious flush brightens and enlivens the landscape. It is though some titanic artist in an hour of inspiration were retouching the picture, painting in deep purple shadows among the rocks, strengthening the lights on the sands, gilding and beautifying everything, and making the whole scene live. The river, whose windings make it look like a lake, turns from muddy brown to silver gray. The sky from a dull blue deepens into violet in the west. Everything under that magic touch becomes vivid and alive. And then the sun sinks altogether behind the rocks, the colors fade out of the sky, the flush off the sands, and gradually everything darkens and grows gray, like a man's cheek when he is bleeding to death. We are left sad and sorrowful in the dark, until the stars light up and remind us that there is always something beyond. In a land whose beauty is the beauty of a moment, whose face is desolate, and whose character is strangely stern, the curse of war was hardly needed to produce a melancholy effect. Why should there be caustic plants where everything is hot and burning, in deserts where thirst is enthroned, and where the rocks and sand appeal to a pitiless sky for moisture, it was a savage trick to add the mockery of mirage. The area multiplies the desolation. There is life only by the Nile. If a man were to leave the river, he might journey westward and find no human habitation, nor the smoke of a cooking fire, except the lonely tent of a kababish Arab, or the encampment of a trader's caravan, Till he reached the coastline of America. Or he might go east, and find nothing but sand, and sea, and sun, until Bombay rose above the horizon. The thread of fresh water is itself solitary in regions where all living things lack company. In the account of the river war, the Nile is naturally supreme. It is the great melody that recurs throughout the whole opera. The general purposing military operations, the statesman who would decide upon grave policies, and the reader desirous of studying the course and results of either, must think of the Nile. It is the life of the lands through which it flows. It is the cause of the war, the means by which we fight, the end at which we aim. Imagination should paint the river through every page in the story. It glitters between the palm trees during the actions, it is the explanation of nearly every military movement. By its banks the armies camp at night. Backed or flanked on its unfordable stream they offer or accept battle by day. To its brink, morning and evening, long lines of camels, horses, mules and slaughter cattle hurry eagerly. Amir and Dervish, officer and soldier, friend and foe, kneel alike to this god of ancient Egypt and draw each day their daily water in goatskin or canteen. Without the river, none would have started. Without it, none might have continued. Without it, none could ever have returned. All who journey on the Nile, whether in commerce or war, will pay their tribute of respect and gratitude, for the great river has befriended all races and every age. Through all the centuries it has performed the annual miracle of its flood, Every year when the rains fall and the mountain snows of Central Africa begin to melt, the head streams become torrents and the great lakes are filled to the brim. A vast expanse of low, swampy lands, crossed by secondary channels and flooded for many miles, regulates the flow, 
and by a sponge-like action prevents the excess of one year from causing the deficiency of the next. Far away in Egypt, prince, priest, and peasant look southwards with anxious attention for the fluctuating yet certain rise. Gradually the flood begins. The Bar el Ghazal from a channel of stagnant pools and marshes becomes a broad and navigable stream. The Sobat and the Atbara from dry watercourses with occasional pools, in which the fish and crocodiles are crowded, turn to rushing rivers. But all this is remote from Egypt. After its confluence with the Atbara, no drop of water reaches the Nile, and it flows for seven hundred miles through the sands, or rushes in cataracts among the rocks of the Nubian desert. Nevertheless, in spite of the tremendous diminution in volume caused by the dryness of the earth and air, and the heat of the sun, all of which drink greedily, the river below Aswan is sufficiently great to supply nine millions of people with as much water as their utmost science and energies can draw. And yet to pour into the Mediterranean a low-water surplus current of 61,500 cubic feet per second. Nor is its water its only gift. As the Nile rises, its complexion is changed. The clear blue river becomes thick and red, laden with the magic mud that can raise cities from the desert sand and make the wilderness a garden. The geographer may still, in the arrogance of science, describe the Nile as a great, steady-flowing river fed by the rains of the tropics, controlled by the existence of a vast head reservoir and several areas of repose, and annually flooded by the accession of a great body of water with which its eastern tributaries are flushed, taken from the Encyclopedia Britannica. But all who have drunk deeply of its soft yet fateful waters, fateful since they give both life and death, will understand why the old Egyptians worshipped the river nor will they even in modern days easily dissociate from their minds a feeling of mystic reverence. South of Khartoum and the military Sudan, the land becomes more fruitful. The tributaries of the Nile multiply the areas of riparian fertility. A considerable rainfall, increasing as the equator is approached, enables the intervening spaces to support vegetation and consequently human life. The greater part of the country is feverish and unhealthy, nor can Europeans long sustain the attacks of its climate. Nevertheless, it is by no means valueless. On the east, the province of Senar used to produce abundant grain, and might easily produce no less abundant cotton. Westward, the vast territories of Kordofan and Darfur afford grazing grounds to a multitude of cattle give means of livelihood to great numbers of Bagara or cowherd Arabs, who may also pursue with activity and stratagem the fleet giraffe and the still fleeter ostrich. To the southeast lies Bar el Ghazal, a great tract of country occupied by dense woods and plentifully watered. Further south and nearer the equator, the forests and marshes become exuberant with tropical growths and the whole face of the land is moist and green. Amid groves of gigantic trees and through plains of high-waving grass, the stately elephant roams in herds which occasionally number four hundred, hardly ever disturbed by a well-armed hunter. The ivory of their tusks constitutes the wealth of the equatorial province. So greatly they abound that Amin Pasha is provoked to complain of a pest of these valuable pachyderms, taken from the life of Amin Pasha, Volume 1, Chapter 9. And although they are only assailed by the natives with spear and gun, no less than 12,000 hundredweight of ivory has been exported in a single year. Ibid. All other kinds of large beasts known to man inhabit these obscure retreats. The fierce rhinoceros crashes through the undergrowth. Among the reeds of melancholy swamps, huge hippopotami, crocodiles and buffaloes prosper and increase. Antelope of every known and many unclassified species, serpents of peculiar venom, countless millions of birds, butterflies, and beetles are among the offspring of prolific nature. And the daring sportsman who should survive his expedition would not fail to add to the achievements of science and the extent of natural history as well as to his own reputation. 
The human inhabitants of the Sudan would not, but for their vices and misfortunes, be disproportioned in numbers to the fauna or less happy. War, slavery, and oppression have, however, afflicted them until the total population of the whole country does not exceed at the most liberal estimate three million souls. The huge area contains many differences of climate and conditions, and these have produced peculiar and diverse breeds of men. The Sudanese are of many tribes, but two main races can be clearly distinguished, the aboriginal natives and the Arab settlers. The indigenous inhabitants of the country were Negroes as black as coal. Strong, virile, and simple-minded savages, they lived as we may imagine prehistoric men, hunting, fighting, marrying, and dying, with no ideas beyond the gratification of their physical desires, and no fears save those engendered by ghosts, witchcraft, the worship of ancestors, and other forms of superstition common among peoples of low development. They displayed the virtues of barbarism. They were brave and honest. The smallness of their intelligence excused the degradation of their habits. Their ignorance secured their innocence. Yet their eulogy must be short, for though their customs, language, and appearance vary with the districts they inhabit and the subdivisions to which they belong, the history of all is a confused legend of strife and misery. Their natures are uniformly cruel and thriftless, and their condition is one of equal squalor and want. Although the Negroes are the more numerous, the Arabs exceed in power. The bravery of the aboriginals is outweighed by the intelligence of the invaders and their superior force of character. During the second century of the Mohammedan era, when the inhabitants of Arabia went forth to conquer the world, one adventurous army struck south. The first pioneers were followed at intervals by continual immigrations of Arabs not only from Arabia, but also across the deserts from Egypt and Morocco. The element thus introduced has spread and is spreading throughout the Sudan, as water soaks into a dry sponge. The aboriginals absorbed the invaders they could not repel. The stronger race imposed its customs and language on the Negroes. The vigor of their blood sensibly altered the facial appearance of the Sudanese. For more than a thousand years, the influence of Mohammedanism, which appears to possess a strange fascination for Negroid races, has been permeating the Sudan, and, although ignorance and natural obstacles impede the progress of new ideas, the whole of the black race is gradually adopting the new religion and developing Arab characteristics. In the districts of the north, where the original invaders settled, the evolution is complete, and the Arabs of the Sudan are a race formed by the interbreeding of Negro and Arab, and yet distinct from both. In the more remote and inaccessible regions which lie to the south and west, the Negro race remains as yet unchanged by the Arab influence. And between these extremes, every degree of mixture is to be found. In some tribes, pure Arabic is spoken, and prior to the rise of the Mahdi, the Orthodox Muslim faith was practiced. In others, Arabic has merely modified the ancient dialects, and the Mohammedan religion has been adapted to the older superstitions. But although the gap between the Arab Negro and the Negro pure is thus filled by every intermediate blend, the two races were, at an early date, quite distinct. The qualities of mongrels are rarely admirable, and the mixture of the Arab and Negro types has produced a debased and cruel breed, more shocking because they are more intelligent than the primitive savages. The stronger race soon began to prey upon the simple aboriginals. Some of the Arab tribes were camel breeders, some were goat herds, some were bagaras or cow herds, but all without exception were hunters of men. To the great slave market at Jeddah, a continual stream of Negro captives has flowed for hundreds of years. The invention of gunpowder and the adoption by the Arabs of firearms facilitated the traffic by placing the ignorant Negroes at a further disadvantage. Thus, the situation in the Sudan for several centuries may be summed up as follows. The dominant race of Arab invaders was unceasingly spreading its blood, religion, customs, and language among the black aboriginal population, and at the same time it harried and enslaved them. 
The state of society that arose out of this may be easily imagined. The warlike Arab tribes fought and brawled among themselves in ceaseless feud and strife. The Negroes trembled in apprehension of capture or rose locally against their oppressors. Occasionally an important sheikh would affect the combination of many tribes, and a kingdom came into existence, a community consisting of a military class armed with guns and of multitudes of slaves, at once their servants and their merchandise, and sometimes trained as soldiers. The dominion might prosper viciously till it was overthrown by some more powerful league. All this was unheeded by the outer world, from which the Sudan is separated by the deserts, and it seemed that the slow, painful course of development would be unaided and uninterrupted. But at last the populations of Europe changed. Another civilization reared itself above the ruins of Roman triumph and Mohammedan aspiration, a civilization more powerful, more glorious, but no less aggressive. The impulse of conquest which hurried the French and English to Canada and the Indies, which sent the Dutch to the Cape and the Spaniards to Peru, spread to Africa and led the Egyptians to the Sudan. In the year 1819, Muhammad Ali, availing himself of the disorders alike as an excuse and an opportunity, sent his son Ismail up the Nile with a great army. The Arab tribes, torn by dissension, exhausted by thirty years of general war, and no longer inspired by their neglected religion, offered a weak resistance. Their slaves, having known the worst of life, were apathetic. The black aboriginals were silent and afraid. The whole vast territory was conquered with very little fighting, and the victorious army, leaving garrisons, returned in triumph to the delta. What enterprise that an enlightened community may attempt is more noble and more profitable than the reclamation from barbarism of fertile regions and large populations? To give peace to warring tribes, to administer justice where all was violence, to strike the chains off the slave, to draw the richness from the soil, to plant the earliest seeds of commerce and learning, to increase in whole peoples their capacities for pleasure and diminish their chances of pain. What more beautiful ideal or more valuable reward can inspire human effort? The act is virtuous, the exercise invigorating, and the result often extremely profitable. Yet, as the mind turns from the wonderful cloudland of aspiration to the ugly scaffolding of attempt and achievement, a succession of opposite ideas arises. Industrious races are displayed stinted and starved for the sake of an expensive imperialism which they can only enjoy if they are well fed. Wild peoples, ignorant of their barbarism, callous of suffering, careless of life but tenacious of liberty, are seen to resist with fury the philanthropic invaders, and to perish in thousands before they are convinced of their mistake. The inevitable gap between conquest and dominion becomes filled with the figures of the greedy trader, the inopportune missionary, the ambitious soldier, and the lying speculator, who disquiet the minds of the conquered and excite the sordid appetites of the conquerors. And as the eye of thought rests on these sinister features, it hardly seems possible for us to believe that any fair prospect is approached by so foul a path. From 1819 to 1883, Egypt ruled the Sudan. Her rule was not kindly, wise, or profitable. Its aim was to exploit, not to improve the local population. The miseries of the people were aggravated rather than lessened but they were concealed. For the rough injustice of the sword, there were substituted the intricacies of corruption and bribery. Violence and plunder were more hideous, since they were cloaked with legality and armed with authority. The land was undeveloped and poor. It barely sustained its inhabitants. The additional burden of a considerable foreign garrison and a crowd of rapacious officials increased the severity of the economic conditions. Scarcity was frequent. Famines were periodical. Corrupt and incapable governors-general succeeded each other at Khartoum with bewildering rapidity. The constant changes, while they prevented the continuity of any wise policy, did not interrupt the misrule. 
with hardly any exceptions, the Pashas were consistent in oppression. The success of their administration was measured by the ministries in Egypt by the amount of money they could extort from the natives. Among the officials in the Sudan, by the number of useless offices they could create. There were a few bright examples of honest men, but these, by providing a contrast, only increased the discontents. The rule of Egypt was iniquitous, yet it preserved the magnificent appearance of imperial dominion. The Egyptian proconsul lived in state at the confluence of the Niles. The representatives of foreign powers established themselves in the city, the trade of the south converged upon Khartoum. Thither the subordinate governors, Beys and Mudirs, repaired at intervals to report the state of their provinces and to receive instructions. Thither were sent the ivory of Equatoria, the ostrich feathers of Kordofan, gum from Darfur, grain from Senar, and taxes collected from all the regions. Strange beasts, entrapped in the swamps and forests, passed through the capital on their journey to Cairo and Europe. Complex and imposing reports of revenue and expenditure were annually compiled. An elaborate and dignified correspondence was maintained between Egypt and its great dependency. The casual observer, astonished at the unusual capacity for government displayed by an Oriental people, was tempted to accept the famous assertion which Nubar Pasha put into the mouth of the Khedive Ismail. We are no longer in Africa, but in Europe. Yet all was a hateful sham. Quote, the government of the Egyptians in these far-off countries is nothing else but one of brigandage of the very worst description. End quote. By Colonel Gordon in Central Africa, April 11, 1879. The arbitrary and excessive taxes were collected only at the point of the bayonet. If a petty chief fell into arrears, his neighbors were raised against him. If an Arab tribe were recalcitrant, a military expedition was dispatched. Moreover, the ability of the Arabs to pay depended on their success as slave hunters. When there had been a good catch, the revenue profited. The Egyptian government had joined the International League against the slave trade. They combined, however, indirectly but deliberately to make money out of it from Egypt, number 11, 1883. In the miserable, harassing warfare that accompanied the collection of taxes, the vice-regal commanders gained more from fraud than force. No subterfuge, no treachery was too mean for them to adopt. No oath or treaty was too sacred for them to break. Their methods were cruel, and if honor did not impede the achievement, mercy did not restrict the effects of their inglorious successes and the effete administrators delighted to order their timid soldiery to carry out the most savage executions. The political methods and social style of the governors general were imitated more or less exactly by the subordinate officials, according to their degree in the provinces. Since they were completely hidden from the eye of civilization, they enjoyed a greater license in their administration. As their education was inferior, so their habits became more gross. Meanwhile, the volcano on which they disported themselves was ominously silent. The Arab tribes obeyed, and the black population cowered. The authority of a tyrannical government was supported by the presence of a worthless army. Nearly 40,000 men were distributed among eight main and numerous minor garrisons. Isolated in a roadless country by enormous distances and natural obstacles, and living in the midst of large, savage populations of fanatical character and warlike habits, whose exasperation was yearly growing with their miseries, the vice-regal forces might depend for their safety only on the skill of their officers, the excellence of their discipline, and the superiority of their weapons. But the Egyptian officers were at that time distinguished for nothing but their public incapacity and private misbehavior. The evil reputation of the Sudan and its climate deterred the more educated or more wealthy from serving in such distant regions, and none went south who could avoid it. The army which the Khedives maintained in the Delta was, judged by European standards, only a rabble. It was badly trained, rarely paid, and very cowardly. 
and the scum of the army of the Delta was the cream of the army of the Sudan. The officers remained for long periods, many all their lives, in the obscurity of the remote provinces. Some had been sent there in disgrace, others in disfavor. Some had been forced to serve out of Egypt by extreme poverty, others were drawn to the Sudan by the hopes of gratifying peculiar tastes. The majority had harems of the women of the country, which were limited only by the amount of money they could lay their hands on by any method. Many were hopeless and habitual drunkards. Nearly all were dishonest. All were indolent and incapable. Under such leadership, the finest soldiery would have soon degenerated. The Egyptians in the Sudan were not fine soldiers. Like their officers, they were the worst part of the Khedivial army. Like them, they had been driven to the south. Like them, they were slothful and effete. Their training was imperfect, their discipline was lax, their courage was low. Nor was even this all the weakness and peril of their position, for while the regular troops were thus demoralized, there existed a powerful local irregular force of Bazingers, Sudanese riflemen, as well armed as the soldiers, more numerous, more courageous, and who regarded the alien garrisons with fear that continually diminished and hate that continually grew. And behind regulars and irregulars alike, the wild Arab tribes of the desert and the hardy blacks of the forests, goaded by suffering and injustice, thought the foreigners the cause of all their woes, and were delayed only by their inability to combine from sweeping them off the face of the earth. Never was there such a house of cards as the Egyptian dominion in the Sudan. The marvel is that it stood so long, not that it fell so soon. The names of two men of character and fame are forever connected with the actual outburst. One was an English general, the other an Arab priest. Yet, in spite of the great gulf and vivid contrast between their conditions, they resembled each other in many respects. Both were earnest and enthusiastic men of keen sympathies and passionate emotions. Both were powerfully swayed by religious fervor. Both exerted great personal influence on all who came in contact with them. Both were reformers. The Arab was an African reproduction of the Englishman. The Englishman, a superior and civilized development of the Arab. In the end, they fought to the death. But for an important part of their lives, their influence on the fortunes of the Sudan was exerted in the same direction. Muhammad Ahmed, the Mahdi, will be discussed in his own place. Charles Gordon needs little introduction. Long before this tale begins, his reputation was European, and the fame of the ever-victorious army had spread far beyond the Great Wall of China. The misgovernment of the Egyptians and the misery of the Sudanese reached their greatest extreme in the seventh decade of the present century. From such a situation there seemed to be no issue other than by force of arms. The Arab tribes lacked no provocation, yet they were destitute of two moral forces essential to all rebellions. The first was the knowledge that better things existed. The second was a spirit of combination. General Gordon showed them the first, the Mahdi provided the second. It is impossible to study any part of Charles Gordon's career without being drawn to all the rest, as his wild and varied fortunes lead him from Sebastopol to Peking, from Gravesend to South Africa, from Mauritius to the Sudan, the reader follows fascinated. Every scene is strange, terrible, or dramatic. Yet, remarkable as are the scenes, the actor is the more extraordinary, a type without comparison in modern times and with few likenesses in history. Rare and precious is the truly disinterested man, potentates of many lands in different degree, the Emperor of China, the King of the Belgians, the Premier of Cape Colony, the Khedive of Egypt, competed to secure his services. The importance of his offices varied no less than their nature. One day he was a subaltern of sappers, on another he commanded the Chinese army, the next he directed an orphanage, or was governor general of the Sudan, with supreme powers of life and death and peace and war, or served as private secretary to Lord Ripon. But in whatever capacity he labored, he was true to his reputation. 
whether he is portrayed bitterly criticizing to Graham the tactics of the assault on the Redan, or pulling the head of Lar Wang from under his bedstead and waving it in paroxysms of indignation before the astonished eyes of Sir Halliday McCartney, or riding alone into the camp of the rebel Suleiman and receiving the respectful salutes of those who had meant to kill him, or telling the Khedive Ismail that he must have the whole Sudan to govern, or reducing his salary to half the regulation amount because he thought it was too much, or ruling a country as large as Europe, or collecting facts for Lord Ripon's rhetorical efforts, we perceive a man careless alike of the frowns of men or the smiles of women, of life or comfort, wealth or fame. It was a pity that one, thus gloriously free from the ordinary restraining influence of human society, should have found in his own character so little mental ballast. His moods were capricious and uncertain, his passions violent, his impulses sudden and inconsistent. The mortal enemy of the morning had become a trusted ally before the night. The friend he loved today he loathed tomorrow. Scheme after scheme formed in his fertile brain, and jostled confusingly together. All in succession were pressed with enthusiasm, all at times were rejected with disdain. A temperament naturally neurotic had been aggravated by an acquired habit of smoking, and the general carried this to so great an extreme that he was rarely seen without a cigarette. His virtues are famous among men. His daring and resource might turn the tide of war. His energy would have animated a whole people. His achievements are upon record but it must also be set down that few more uncertain and impracticable forces than Gordon have ever been introduced into administration and diplomacy. Although the Egyptian government might loudly proclaim their detestation of slavery, their behavior in the Sudan was viewed with suspicion by the European powers, and particularly by Great Britain. To vindicate his sincerity, the Khedive Ismail in 1874 appointed Gordon to be governor of the equatorial province in succession to Sir Samuel Baker. The name of the general was a sufficient guarantee that the slave trade was being earnestly attacked. The Khedive would gladly have stopped at the guarantee and satisfied the world without disturbing vested interests. But the mission, which may have been originally instituted as a pretense, soon became in Gordon's energetic hands very real. Circumstances, moreover, soon enlisted the sympathies of the Egyptian government on the side of their zealous agent. The slave dealers had committed every variety of atrocity for which the most odious traffic in the world afforded occasion. But when, under the leadership of Zubair Rahamna, they refused to pay their annual tribute, it was felt in Cairo that their crimes had cried aloud for chastisement. Zubair is sufficiently described when it has been said that he was the most notorious slave dealer Africa has ever produced. His infamy had spread beyond the limits of the continent which was the scene of his exploits to the distant nations of the north and west. In reality, his rule was a distinct advance on the anarchy which had preceded it, and certainly he was no worse than others of his vile trade. His scale of business was, however, more extended. What William Whiteley was in respect of goods and chattels, that was Zubair in respect of slaves, a universal provider. Magnitude lends a certain grandeur to crime, and Zubair in the height of his power, at the head of the slave merchant's confederacy, might boast the retinue of a king and exercise authority over wide regions and a powerful army. As early as 1869, he was practically the independent ruler of the Bar el Ghazal. The Khedive resolved to assert his rights. A small Egyptian force was sent to subdue the rebel slaver, who not only disgraced humanity, but refused to pay tribute. Like most of the Khedivial expeditions, the troops under Belil Bey met with ill fortune. They came, they saw, they ran away. Some, less speedy than the rest, fell on the field of dishonor. The rebellion was open. Nevertheless, it was the Khedive who sought peace. Subair apologized for defeating the vice-regal soldiers and remained supreme in the Bar el Ghazal. Thence he planned the conquest of Darfur, at that time an independent kingdom. 
the Egyptian government were glad to join with him in the enterprise. The man they had been unable to conquer, they found it expedient to assist. The operations were successful. The king of Darfur, who was distinguished no less for his valor than for his folly, was killed. The whole country was subdued. The whole population available after the battles became slaves. Zubair thus wielded a formidable power. The Khedivial government, thinking to ensure his loyalty, created him a pasha, a rank which he could scarcely disgrace, and the authority of the rebel was thus unwillingly recognized by the ruler. Such was the situation when Gordon first came to the Sudan. It was beyond the power of the new governor of the equatorial province at once to destroy the slave-hunting confederacy. Yet he struck heavy blows at the slave trade, and when in 1877, after a short visit to England, he returned to the Sudan as governor-general and with absolute power, he assailed it with redoubled energy. Fortune assisted his efforts, for the able Zubair was enticed to Cairo, and once there, the government refused to allow their faithful ally and distinguished guest to go back to his happy hunting grounds. Although the slave dealers were thus robbed of their great leader, they were still strong, and Zubair's son, the brave Suleiman, found a considerable following. Furious at his father's captivity, and alarmed lest his own should follow, he meditated revolt. But the governor-general, mounted on a swift camel and attired in full uniform, rode alone into the rebel camp and compelled the submission of its chiefs before they could recover from their amazement. The confederacy was severely shaken, and when, in the following year, Suleiman again revolted, the Egyptian troops under Gessi Pasha were able to disperse his forces and induce him to surrender on terms. The terms were broken, and Suleiman and ten of his companions suffered death by shooting. Taken from von Slaten, Baron Rudolf Karl, Fire and Sword in the Sudan, page 28. The League of the Slave Dealers was thus destroyed. End of Part 1 of Chapter 1